Yes, yeah, uh, my name is oh. Christiansen, Danish, Burmese, German. I'm an Australian by passport. Uh, and I apologize for not having any pictures, but it's a, bi a prejudice I have. And I think my students, I used to be a university lecturer until recently, uh, they would listen more and learn more if they listened rather than looking at pictures. Maybe wrong. Uh, I want you to want to read my conclusion first, because I may not get that far. Uh, and I'm basically an energy person who also studied uh, the IPCC and participated in the IPCC. Uh, but my conclusion as far as energy is concerned, and here I'm with the majority of the people here, the nature of future energy supplies should be decided by markets in national or regional or even local context, subject to market-based technological change, because I'm very interested in innovation and to what extent the, the carbon threat, what I call carbon phobia, actually does help innovation and technical change. Uh, but this technological change should be uh, market-based rather than forced by salads, we've heard about the salads, I call them salads, ambitious bureaucrats, and I will talk a bit about the bureaucracies, because some bureaucracies are very important in this, and bureaucracies are often underestimated. The bureaucrats I've met, and I've met many of them, are very clever people. And many of them are climate skeptics, even the most, biggest, the most powerful ones in the past in Britain. I know the chap who negotiated the Rio conference, for example, the climate treaty. They were climate skeptics then, and they're climate skeptics now. So what were their real reasons? And this is the main criticism. Uh, Oh, wait a minute, one more sentence. Ambitious bureaucrats and globalizing institutions. Now, you know where I, where I stand. Now, I, w I want to say more about the bureaucrats in a minute, but they're not fools, and you don't have to be a supporter of the climate threat or a supporter of decarbonization or suffering from carbon phobia, as I call it, uh, and, and you don't have to believe in this and yet use the threat to make politics. And this is my main criticism of what I've heard so far. There's an assumption that environmental policy is based on natural science. Firstly, only on natural science. I taught environmental policy for a long time, and in German, luckily, the word policy and politics are the same word. Policy is made by politics, and science is a tool. And what I want to talk a bit about, how science was used as a tool you talked about this too, but in a narrower range than my European experience. In Europe, at least, most of the funding of uh, climate-related research, and it's huge by now. It covers most of the social science, the psychology, poetry even. I mean, you have no idea, if I get all this stuff, how many books are written about climate. Even at, at, at with Elgar, you can't get a book on energy anymore. It's all energy and climate. I mean, it, it is not just a natural science problem. The research agenda involving climate has covered all disciplines now and has really perverted, if you like, and undermined and weakened the whole research sector of the Western world. And I, as an editor, I have a lot of experience of this, so I could hold on a force about this. Uh, I also want to say something about, mainly later on, about science. But before I forget, could I have this for a minute? No, this one. This one. Yeah, this one. Piece of paper. Yeah. I tried, and this is a, a, a mission of failure, I tried to protect science and almost succeeded, I thought, because I was employed for many years. I got a huge research grant from the British government, not from a, a thing like this, from a British uh, Social and Economic Research Council, to study the politics and science of the IPCC. I had access to, and I stopped about the mid-1990s, but I became a, a lecturer. Uh, I interviewed most of the leading IPPC people, including Sir John Horton and including Bob Watson. I want to tell you about Bob Watson. I interviewed him about the IPPC and its science. Uh, and I knew him a little bit, of him a bit from, from the scientific friendships and connections in, in, in Britain. I interviewed him in Washington. I can remember clearly getting there. Uh, and I said to him, for my studies on acid rain and marine pollution, you're very unwise to talk about consensus science. Firstly, it's a co contradiction in terms. Uh, and I think you protect yourself in future. If you do what the Germans do in some of their commissions, you re your report has a, a, minor a ma minority and also a, 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 a majority report, but allows a minority 
opinion, that you show the range of views. Now, if, and we had a long discussion on this, and he was actually, I thought at the time, in favor, but it didn't happen. I do not know, I haven't seen him since, I do not know why it didn't happen, but I suspect that the real reason is, if you look at the IPPC, and that's my second criticism of what I've heard here so far, the IPPC consists of three working parties. You've only concentrated on working group number one, which is a natural science. But the powerhouse, I've been trying to preach this for 20 years now, the powerhouse, the decision makers, are in working group three. And these are the people who have the solutions. The others just have to have a nice horrible problem, all these threats, you know, hell if you like. But the salvation comes from working group three. Innovation, energy efficiency, uh, taxation, all the things you've heard about, and you're all against for, for good reasons, sometimes a bit suspicious of your reasons, but overall I think the, uh, the, uh, there was a very powerful image created of fear and disaster. But at the same time, all the time we had the solutions, and this is working group three, and if you want to really understand the, the power of the IPCC, you have to look much more on what they've promised us. So the, uh, coming back to the, today, from the European and British perspective, I almost almost prepared to say the battle against carbon phobia has been lost. Uh, so at least in Europe, but there are signs, it's weakening, they're slowing down, the subsidies are going down a bit, but the idea that we have legal commitments to reduce emissions to save the planet or save our economy or defeat the Chinese in, in, in competition is enshrined in virtually all European legislation. I'm not sure what's happening here, I think the battle is still going. You know, you, you don't like Obama and you don't like what he's doing. I can understand what he's doing, but, you know, I can't really agree with it. It's going to be interesting what will happen in the United States in the next uh, few years. Uh, internationally, I have more doubts. Uh, I think the, the, the rest of the world will decarbonize to the extent that it suits... It, it, the rest of the world will decarbonize to the extent that it suits them economically. And they'll do their very best, and they probably won't succeed in getting a huge amount of money from the North or from the rich. Because this brings me to my, uh, one of my main points. Carbon dioxide was the ideal pollutant. It crosses political, inverted commas, it crosses political boundaries like no other pollutant. And the moment you cross, a pollutant crosses political boundaries, you can do politics with it. Your neighbor's damage or your, he damages you, and the carbon issue has become a major issue in international politics and in, uh, in, uh, in, in trade. I could get a, a great deal about this, but if you look at it in details, you, fi you finish up with two fundamental questions. Uh, is it true that uh, the carbon scare has been incredibly a large stimulation to, uh, to technological change, to innovation. That's what the Germans in particular, but also the British, put a lot of their hope on. By, carb, carb, by all this taxation, by all this uh, scaremongering, they will persuade the masses, you and me, to buy more, to buy new stuff, to buy smart meters, uh, to invest. And I think your main enemy at the moment, in the way I see it, is, is, is not the NGOs anymore. It's, 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 it's the bankers, it's the financial institutions who are playing a war against carbon. They want investors, to, pension funds, governments, banks, to disinvest from carbon. Now, why are they trying to do this? Uh, I don't know the full answer. Uh, I've already made the, question, the, the, the point that the big bureaucracies I know are clever people and they're not necessarily believers in the carbon so they use it for political purposes, for financial purposes. And something I had hoped would happen hasn't happened after the 2008 economic collapse, relative collapse. But the problem with, with the capitalists and the banking the world financial system is very serious, uh, more serious than most of us probably realize. Uh, I thought this would end this decarbonization effort, but I think the opposite has happened. They think they can get more money out of us and reinvest it in new technologies, in new efforts. So I don't know what the future will hold, but I don't think decarbonization is going to be achieved very quickly. So if you want to succeed, you need more than anything else, you need allies. And this brings me to my, uh, my last point. Where are these allies to be found? I don't think uh, a, a purely uh, 
sing, a single party might be able to achieve it in the in, 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 in United States. But I have my doubts. And you're divided yourself, as I noticed today. Uh, who, who are the real people that are not beneficiaries? The bureaucracies are the main beneficiary, there's no doubt about it. And I, I haven't got any numbers for this, but the, the growth of carbon counters, carbon accounters, the foot, uh, carbon footprint measurers, the, the big in, in investment organizations are trying to work out how much carbon they in investment is increased or reduced. The, the carbon is, because you can measure it, because you can model it by computers, has become a major employer of the middle classes uh, and, and people in the north. I don't, haven't got numbers, but it's going to be difficult to stop this carbon counting. And this is done increasingly by private people, but also by bu bureaucracies. Bureaucracies in Britain work on adaptation. They worked on medit mediation or meditation. They worked on anything to do about to do with carbon. They're trying to save the economies by this decarbonisation process. I think they will fail. But I think the thing what is our greatest ally is the people do not want to do lots of the things they're supposed to. And other problems will overwhelm our bureaucracies. They might have to do other things, whether it's looking after the old, whether our education. I think the carbon thing is most likely to be defeated by other pressures on the bureaucracies to do more important things. And the other thing, of course, is uh, science. I wanted to, I want to finish with this. Why has science become so important in this debate? I've thought a lot about this. And I think the problem is if you want an international political movement to save the world or transfer wealth or technology from the rich to the poor, or you just want to do good, you need authority. Now, what's happened, and I was part of this process, but there is no single God you can unite that who could act as an authority for the whole of mankind. I think some people here have claimed that the Christian God might do it, he won't. Uh, what else is there as authority? The people who made the decision decided it would be science. Consensus science. You know that's not true. We all know science doesn't work like this. You cannot have science is not truth. Science is always changing. It's a progressive thing. It brings us closer to the truth. But to, 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 to claim that science would be the authority, that's what happened at the World Bank, that's happened at the United Nations, that happened uh, 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 at UNEP. And the scientific community fell for it. And they were very happy. They grew hugely. But I think we've got a very dangerous research uh, world at the moment where research is funded for the wrong reasons by the wrong people. Nothing that should should do it. Have I done it you in did. time? I didn't stick to my text, did I?